Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Tran. I'm the Community Relations Specialist here at Quasi. I want to welcome everyone to Quasi's 2017 Spring Cyber Seminar Series. It is on heterogeneity, complexity, and anomalous transport in hydrologic systems. And our host is Yoga Bolster from Notre Dame University. Um, just a few quick notes. Um, Philippe will we'll do his presentation, but we will be taking all questions at the end of the presentation and so please type it in the chat box and then we'll read it out loud and Felipe will answer them. So go ahead, Yoga. Okay, welcome to the, the third seminar in this series. Uh, during week one, Rena Schumer gave us a nice overview of anomalous transport. Um, last week we had Antoine Obono talk to us about anomalous transport in streams and rivers. Um, today we're going into the subsurface with Felipe de Barros from the University of Southern California. Um, I won't steal any more time from him. Go ahead, Philippe. All right, okay, so thank you very much, Diogo, and thank you very much, Liz. I uh, hope that everyone can actually hear me well. Uh, let me begin first of all for a big wow, and by wow, I mean I never gave a talk to an invisible audience, um, but I follow Liz's suggestion, so I have a, like a fake audience in front of me, which I put some Smurfs. I mean, I have some little toy Smurfs over here, so I can actually look at them uh, while I'm giving the talk. Okay, this is not definitely definitely not relevant for solid transport and aquifers. Um, but uh, okay, so let's enough talking about the Smurfs. Let's talk about uh, 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 the presentation itself. Okay, so to my invisible audience, hello everyone, and thank you very much for attending this. Uh, my name is Felipe de Barros. I'm here at USC, and uh, the talk is today on solid transport and heterogeneous aquifers and implications for risk assessment. Um, so as mentioned by Diogo, uh, Rina and Antoine gave a lot, uh, a lot of uh, information about anomalous transport. Now, what I want to see is how all of this anormality or, or no faking behavior uh, induced by heterogeneities in a subsurface environment actually uh, is important uh, in the context of decision making. And here when I say risk assessment, I'm actually uh, being a little bit more specific about this. I'm actually concerned about human health risk assessment, okay? So let me give you an overview of what I mean by this, and I hope you can see my slides, and hopefully uh, uh, my mouse moving in circles in this talk, okay? Uh, so this is the big system that we're actually interested in, especially when we're dealing with hydro systems, okay? Contaminated hydro systems, right? We have some kind of contaminant that is actually released in uh, some kind of zone, right? And it percolates through the unsaturated zone or seeps down, may reach a water table, and of course, there are multiple ways that aquifers can actually be contaminated. This is just one possible example. And this plume will actually move in the subsurface formation. It may hit or miss, all right, the pumping well, which will uh, transfer water, or supply water to humans, which can be exposed to this contamination through different pathways. For example, uh, uh, ingestion of, 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 of water is one way. You know, so imagine you have a glass of water over here, you're putting this directly into your body, or dermal contact. But if you have some kind of volatile contaminants, I mean, you can even inhale uh, uh, that substance through your nose and go directly into your lung. So this is the type of systems that we're actually uh, are concerned with. Um, but if you're a risk manager, really what you're interested in is two main questions, right? I mean, how long will contaminants be exposed to the contamination? And what is the magnitude of of exposure, or will the plume hit or not that environmentally sensitive target? Okay, so these are the type of questions that we're actually interested in. Now, uh, you, I hope you believe me um, when I tell you that actually heterogeneity of the aquifer itself, with the hydraulic properties, actually can affect the decision making. All right, so that's the whole purpose of this talk. I want to provide you an overview uh, uh, of how uh, 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 heterogeneity and the subsurface formation, okay, can affect these questions or, or the answers to these questions. So if you're a hydrogeologist, your, your, your view to this question, uh, you'll tell me, okay, well, this is extremely challenging. Why? First of all, because hydraulic properties, right, they are multi-scale variable. So in other words, if you look at this triangle over here, we have variability and properties occurring at a millimeter scale, all the way to centimeters, meters and kilometers and such and such on. Uh, the thing is that these properties, for example, such as the hydraulic conductivity, uh, they can vary by orders of magnitude. So imagine you have this image of this outcrop, right? So you can see that we see uh, some kind of stratified formation uh, 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 in this uh, geological media. Uh, so it's like a layered cake, 
all right, uh, uh, not to eat, okay, this is uh, soil, uh, but we see that we have some kind of uh, coarse material, but very fine material, and if you look at the hydraulic conductivity versus staff, you can see in this cartoon over here that it can vary by orders of magnitudes from 10 to the minus 4 all the way to 10 to the minus 1 and so on, okay, so that's, so you can imagine that this variability is actually going to create a huge impact on, uh, on, our, on, uh, on the way the plumes are actually spreading, all right? So that's a, that's a key point of this talk too, right? The second thing is that we have to deal with the fact that we don't have complete characterization of the system, right? The subsurface is extremely challenging to characterize, and that's why it is so important to, do, to, to rely on stochastic methods because in reality, we cannot see what's really happening down there. We have only a few measurements at different support scales, okay, that's very important to the scale of the measurements, right? But we don't have, a, 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 let's say, a concrete idea or certainty of what's happening in between these measurements, right? So therefore, that's why there's a whole field, an elegant field of stochastic hydrogeology uh, uh, that enables us to quantify flow and transport in this natural geological medium that honors the data that we uh, characterize, that we collect in, in, in the field, but aligns together with physically-based models Okay, so just let me show you uh, uh, what this heterogeneity actually does to plumes. So here I have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, series of simulations over here that I took uh, 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 from a friend of mine, Aldo Fiori and Igor Jankovic. Uh, they published this in Mathematical Geosciences in 2012, where we have a spatially heterogeneous flow field. Okay, so here you can see uh, 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 this uh, erratic uh, uh, flow paths. And, uh, and here we have a line source. So there's a instantaneous injection in this line source over here. So we have an initial time. And then at a later time, we see that the plume starts uh, uh, spreading out in a more irregular way. It kind of conforms to the fast flow channels, okay? So this gives you an idea that connectivity and, and these heterogeneous uh, fields actually uh, start to play a significant role. And then at a much later time, or well, not much later, but let's say a later time, we see that the plume is actually uh, spread out in a very irregular manner. manner. So uh, we see that the plume is actually distorted, and this is because, again, we have the shearing and straining mechanisms kicking in, um, but it's, it's spreading is highly irregular. So therefore, that's one of the causes of this no thicken uh, transfer behavior. So in other words, the spreading of the plume does not grow in a linear fashion. Uh, 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 um, the spatial moments of the grow in a linear fashion in time as uh, 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 predicted by fixed uh, uh, law. And we have this no uh, uh, thickened behavior. So we have the existence of these uh, solid fingers or fingerings that are very complicated to model. Now, uh, at the same time, I want to highlight a few other elements over here that we have. Look, so if you look at this picture on your right, the right of your screen, okay, we have this erratic plume over here, but we have different scales where different physical processes are actually happening. So we have something which is a spreading scale where you have fluctuations of the velocity field, but at the same time, we have something which is known as a mixing scale. These are the very small scales that are, that are mixing is actually occurring where diffusion is actually acting. Now, an important thing here too is that there's another scale that people oftentimes they don't talk about, which is the artificial scale imposed by numerical modeling. Right? And that's the constant block scale here, if you have a constant numerical grid in your model, or even if you have an adaptive, we have a grid block where all these fluctuations here are somehow homogenized, and they can be accounted to different methods or different uh, techniques, which is not the focus of this talk, uh, but uh, the point is that we have multiple scales when we're dealing with solid transport and such heterogeneous medium. Okay, so let's talk about uncertainty here. Okay, so heterogeneity is one thing, but what about uncertainty, okay? Uncertainty comes again because we have lack of data or lack of a detailed site characterization. So, so what we end up having here um, is multiple realizations of the aquifer uh, and they obey all the same statistics, all right? That, that's honored by, uh, that needs to be honored uh, uh, that needs to comply uh, with the uh, actual data that we collect. So here we see equiprobable aquifers, okay, with a continuous speed release plume. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving around the plumes over here. And in reality, what we have is multiple realizations of this field. So our predictions, if we're interested in predicting concentrations in such aquifer systems, what we have in the end is some kind of PDF that we want to model. So very close to the contaminant source, we have this bimodal behavior kicking in over here, right? And then as we move further away from the source, 
uh, 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 over all possible realizations of our aquifer, and like in a multi cahal sense, uh, we start observing this unimodal uh, behavior. So there's a transition between bimodal towards a uniform, a unimodal behavior. So this is really important in risk analysis, as I'm going to show to you later on. Okay. So the goal is really to characterize transfer from a statistical point of view, but uh, these plots over here also show a very interesting uh, uh, effect. Let's focus on this possible, this realization here at the bottom left. Okay, maybe you can see this. I'm moving the mouse. Uh, we have the plume over here, and suddenly this plume encounters a full focusing zone. You see, there's a whole collection of streamlines over here, so there's a lot of focusing kicking in. Okay, so what's happening here is that the plume is actually squeezing this fast flow channel. Okay, so the plume squeezes, it changes the concentration gradients, all right, by, uh, by augmenting it, and then we have dilution right after the flow focusing zone, all right, so that's what we observe over here. So, so this is very interesting how the kinematic features of the flow field can actually induce dilution. Now let's look at the plume above, where we see a, a, a persistence of high concentration, right, a lot of red, a lot of yellow, but no flow focusing kicking in in the path of the plume. All right, so again, the plume deforms according to the velocity field, and this velocity field will control the dilution rates. So you can imagine, again, that this is extremely important in risk assessment and remediation. And what I want to highlight here is that the specific features, kinematic features of the heterogeneous flow field, uh, they have a very clear role in, in, in diluting this plume and, and, and controlling the rate of dilution, which will, in turn, affect uh, 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 the uncertainty quantification of the actual system too, okay? Uh, so, uh, what do I mean by this? So, we can take, for example, a heterogeneous flow field, and we can do some really cool things with it. For example, uh, here what I'm showing you is a map of a flow field, but it's not actually the velocity. What I'm actually showing you is a, a flow topology parameter uh, known as the Okubovice parameter. This is a parameter called theta, okay? And the Okubovice parameter is pretty much the, uh, related to the determinant of the velocity gradient tensor. Okay, so you take the velocity gradient tensor, you take the determinant of this, multiply by four, negative over here, and you get this, uh, uh, this, this, this funny looking map over here with a lot of blues, red, and green, and some yellowish color. Now, why is this important? Because this parameter uh, 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 pretty much maps regions of strain, vorticity, and shear along the whole aquifer. So for example, if theta is smaller than zero, we have a vorticity dominated region. If theta is equal to zero, then we have shear flow domination. And then if we have theta larger than zero, then we have strain dominated regions. Now, how does these kinematic features affect dilution? Uh, well, let's look at the dilution index, which is an entropy based metric that uh, uh, Peter Kitanidis proposed in 1994. So the larger the E, the larger the dilution index, uh, the larger is the dilution of the actual plume, okay? So when we have theta smaller than zero, the dilution index scales with T, okay? These are local uh, analysis. Uh, when we have theta equals to zero with shear, it scales T to the power two. And then of course, when we have strain dominated uh, uh, effects, a lot of flow focusing, it scales with the exponential of T. So that's a pretty neat result over here because it allows us to detect or having metrics such as this and there are other metrics too that can, that can uh, tell you some, some information like this, it allows us to actually identify the hot spots of mixing. So we can kind of even geoengineer a system in such a way that we can enhance reactions, we can enhance mixing, we can even improve the capacity of our remediation uh, 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 um, strategies. So these are results that I, I published together with, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, some colleagues in uh, GRL in 2012. Uh, but again, it shows how these specific features of the kinematic, uh, uh, kinematic features, they can actually affect dilutions in different ways, or the rate of dilution, okay, and time. So again, again, we look at the dilution index, the, the larger the heterogeneity, uh, the more dilution we have. Uh, so these are our theoretical models. Uh, uh, that I published together with Aldo Fiori, uh, uh, Francesca Bozo, and Alberto Bellin at GCH uh, 2015. Uh, it's a first order analysis, but uh, we see that uh, uh, as we increase heterogeneity, uh, in other words, we're increasing the variance of the log conductivity. The higher this variance is, the higher the heterogeneity. We see that dilution is actually enhanced, okay? And we want to use models like this uh, uh, to do some predictions in the field. So here we have. Uh, a comparison between the model and the uh, Cape Cod field data. 
Okay, and you see that it, it, that's the whole overall goal. I mean, how do we apply this in, in the actual field itself? Okay, so it's really important to understand how heterogeneity affects these uh, dilution rates and how it affects uh, 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 the all predictions of risk itself. Now, of course, this is one component, but if you're a public health scientist, you say, well, the challenge is not just on the hydrogeological aspects, but coming from a public health point of view, uh, uh, we have to deal with the human body. You know, humans are going to be exposed to some kind of contamination, and this contamination might hit the kidney, uh, 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 maybe a liver, it can cause cancer. So we have to understand how these chemicals are actually metabolized at the cell level, but also at the human body level. So, so you can see like it's, um, it goes from the, uh, from the body all the way to the organs, to the cell level. So you can see there's also a multi-scale element kicking in from the human physiological, physiological point of view. Uh, so, but the thing is that there's a lot of uncertainty in how our human bodies respond to chemicals. So if you think about exposure, that's also another challenging because as shown in this figure, people are different, right? We have to deal with variability as well. So people have different heights, cultural habits, body weight, gender, kids, age group. So, I mean, this all affects the way we respond to contamination. And a lot of our, um, let's say, risk models, especially from a health point of view, are based on what's known to be a response, a dose response curve. So pretty much you take animal data, not all models are like this, this is just one type of model where we have a lot of, uh, a lot of how should I say, uh, animal groups, okay, we, we apply different doses, in other words, we increase the, we increase the concentration uh, which this animal, animal uh, the, uh, group is actually going to be exposed, and we observe in time some kind of response such as cancer. The thing is that in order to observe any type of response in animal data, we have to apply large doses. And then we fit a model and, and we have to extrapolate low doses because at low doses, that's exactly where humans are going to be exposed to. Okay, so that's, a, that's something that we have to keep in mind. So there's a lot of uncertainty also in the way people uh, respond not only to the contaminants, but also in the models that we use to uh, address uh, uh, cancer risk, for example. So again, let's go back to this whole system over here, right? One system where we are looking at human health risk and we see that we have uh, 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 all these different components over here coming from the contaminant source to the environmental media, exposure pathways, and then of course the public health component. Okay, we have to see this from a multi-component stochastic system, right? Because each of these components, they have a huge, uh, or maybe a small amount depending on, on the type of component you have, but they have some level of uncertainty. And then in the end, or whatever is our risk metric, right, we're actually going to quantify this from a probability point of view using probabilistic methods. So here's a PDF, the probability density function of some kind of risk predictions. And what we're really interested in actually identifying these high risks. These are the, uh, what I, I call the extreme events or the tails of the, of the PDF because they are really important. Even though they can be unlikely, they have a low probability of occurring. If they do occur, they are deadly. All right, so uh, it's really important to understand what is this, um, uh, cal calculate the area of the shaded blue area over here. And we can imagine that depending on the type of uh, uh, degrees of uncertainty in each of these components, this probability will change. But we have to cast the problem in a probabilistic uh, 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 manner, okay? So what are the goals of this presentation? Uh, pretty much what I want to show to you is how aquifer heterogeneity and engineering design, and I'm going to come back to that soon, affects risk in its stochastic characterization. So in other words, I want to look at how the heterogeneity of the aquifer, but also engineering design factors such as the sampling device dimensions, you know, you have an observation well, that has a finer dimension, the source dimensions, or maybe the operation of a pumping well, how it affects the, the shape, the actual shape of the PDF of risk, and how these probabilities are actually changing, okay? The second objective is really to be able to communicate uh, uh, these stochastic concepts to decision makers, you know, by being able to identify locations where we're going to have these high risks. But not only the high risk itself, but also the temporal persistence of these high risks. So uh, ideally what I want to show is how aquifer heterogeneity can control the spatial temporal uh, behavior of the risk itself. This can give uh, decision makers an idea uh, uh, of of to select some remediation strategy or 
if they should shut down the well or, or other actions that should be taken. Okay, so let's continue this talk and let me give you a generic uh, problem statement here. So imagine you have an aquifer that's uh, uh, contaminated, okay, and you're in part of a water agency and your question is, is the risk, let's say, uh, less than some kind of critical value, okay, so it can be a critical value established by the US EPA, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency, and I want to know what is this risk? Is it below or above a given value? But by now I should be able to convince you, I should have been able to convince you that we have a lot of uncertainty. So what we don't, cannot quantify this in a, ter, ter, in a deterministic manner. So what we have in reality is a, a probabilistic value. So in other words, I want to quantify the probability, the risk, okay, this R can be a health risk, for example, uh, it can be, let's like, say, uh, an increased lifetime cancer risk, such as a linear model adopted by the EPA, like this one, okay, where we have A is some kind of health-related parameter, uh, and C is the concentration uh, of the chemical. Uh, what is the probability that risk is below some critical value? Now, of course, you're an engineer, and you are uh, a, 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 a hydrogeologist, and you want to be able to quantify this using uh, physically-based models, and be able to quantify this as a function of all the parameters that we can characterize at the field. But at the same time, we want a model that is actually capable of assimilating data as well as we go along the process, right? So this is quite not a challenging problem to solve because this linear relationship allows us to map the risk CDF because this is the cumulative distribution function of the increased lifetime cancer risk with the actual uh, 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 CDF of concentration, okay, just rescaled. So that's quite uh, uh, an interesting thing because we can see that the risk CDF is strongly related to the concentration CDF, okay. This is a fundamental piece in risk analysis. I can go on and on about different models. I mean, I have a list over here of different people who worked on this. And my, my apologies if I am um, forgetting anyone, okay, uh, but pretty much the model that I'll use over here is a model that I developed together with Aldo Fiori in 2014. It's a perturbation theory model, um, and it's semi-analytical, okay, we'll go back to that soon. Uh, so pretty much the, the underlying physical model that I'm actually using in this, um, in, in this presentation, at least a part of this presentation, is based on a steady state flow over here, so you can imagine uh, you have a steady state flow in the absence of sinks and sources for now. Okay, here's the hydraulic conductivity that varies with X in space, right? And, and here's uh, uh, the hydraulic head. Now, I'm modeling uh, the log conductivity Y as a stationary random function, okay, with a univariate PDF, a Gaussian type of PDF. And this random function is characterized by the mean value, uh, the variance of Y, okay, so this tells us the degree of heterogeneity of the system, the higher this, this, this variable is, the larger the heterogeneity, and at the same time, uh, we have a covariance structure that gives us the spatial structure of the conductivity field. These are the integral scales. Now, once we solve for the flow field, we can actually solve for transport. Uh, of course, I'm using here, um, there are multiple ways of doing here, using this, but I'm assuming that that vacuum dispersion equation works, and here I'm referring to a local dispersion. Please do not confuse this or micro dispersion, okay? So this is a local dispersion. So this is the local ADE, okay? Again, more details on the solution technique can actually be found uh, 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 in the paper that I just referred to, uh, as well as the assumptions. But I mean, just to give you a, a quick idea, the assumptions for the analytical model uh, consists of low heterogeneity, but also uh, uh, small plumes. But um, we can go back to that later on. So here I'm actually showing uh, the concentration CDF on the left. Okay, so here we have the CDF of the normalized concentration uh, as a function of the dimensions, the vertical dimensions of the sampling device. So you have an observation well, you have a screen, and this characteristic dimension is called gamma. And we see how the CDF changes with, uh, with gamma. So if we were to predict the, the probability that concentration is lower they said 0.6, we see that it's, this probability is higher if gamma is larger, right? And again, this shows uh, how, how the sampling device can actually induce some artificial mixing inside the actual observation well, which can lead to more probability mass of finding lower concentrations, okay? Again, that doesn't mean that high concentrations doesn't exist. It does, but it's just a shift of the probability mass. Uh, so the first observation that we see is that the sampling device actually impacts the uncertainty estimates at high concentration values, okay? 
So these are the tails of the PDFs that I was referring to before. So you see that uh, it has a lot of sensitivity towards this gamma value. The second thing is that there's an increase of the increase in the sampling volume leads to this reduction of the concentration variability on the ensemble sense, which leads to a reduction in P concentration. That's why we, for larger gamma, we see more probability, a larger probability of concentration being lower. Okay, so uh, this is from PDF and the CDF point of view, but there's also some works on statistical moments uh, uh, done by Ruben et al, 1994, Aldo in 2002 and other co-authors, but also Daniele Tonina and Alberto Bellin in 2008. Okay, where they actually analyzed the, the mean and the variance of the concentration as a function of the sampling device. But here we're actually looking at the full PDF. Now here is another example where we have uh, the same CDF, but instead of using the sampling device, we're actually looking at the dimensions of the contaminant source. So these are all 3D simulations. So we have a cubicle uh, uh, source so with this dimension zeta, all right? And, and in the black curve here, zeta is a small plume, and here is a slightly larger plume, the red curve. And we see that smaller plumes get diluted quicker, quicker, right? So that's what we observe. Okay, in other words, we have more probability mass towards low concentrations when, when zeta is very small. And, uh, and when you have larger plumes, it takes time to attenuate the concentration because uh, um, it takes time to reach the centroid of the plume itself. So this is an example where uh, engineering design can actually affect uh, our dilution rates and decision making as well. Now let's talk about heterogeneity because this is, is a series on heterogeneity. Uh, here we see the concentration CDF, oh no, sorry, not the concentration CDF. We look at the increased lifetime cancer risk CDF as a function of heterogeneity. So here again, remember the variable that I mentioned, the variance of the, of the, of the log conductivity. So the red curve is for a very uh, a low heterogeneous setting, a very low heterogeneity aquifer, and the blue curve is a very, uh, no, not very high, but that's a, on the borderline between low towards a mild heterogeneous formation, okay? And we see that when we crank up, when we boost, let's say, the, uh, the, the heterogeneity of the system, we, we have an increase in the bloom spreading, okay, which leads to uh, uh, an enhancement of dilution, thus leading to a higher probability the risk, or at least the cancer risk is going to be less than some kind of critical value. So if we were to look at a, at a, a, a standard EPA threshold value of uh, uh, cancer risk 1 in 10,000, we see that we have the probability of risk being lower than, than 10 to the minus 4 is higher when sigma is higher, okay? So that tells you how heterogeneity controls these things. Now, remember, that doesn't mean that there is not high risk, right? I mean, there could be events or realizations where the risk is high. It's just the way the probability is actually changing according to the level of heterogeneity. So we have to look at this from a statistical point of view, but not a deterministic point of view, okay? All right, but okay, I talked about uh, 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 the analytical solution, but let me show you some numerical uh, 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 solutions as well, or numerical results. And this is a result uh, that was recently published by my PhD uh, student, uh, Ariano Libera, in collaboration with Roberto Guadagnini, uh, where we're actually interested in seeing the role or the significance of pumping rates in other words, dynamical, the, 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 the temporal evolution of, uh, of pumping rates and actually controlling the risk. So here we see uh, 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 the probability of concentration exceeding some threshold value, okay? So this is a risk uh, of exceedance, okay? A probability of exceedance as a function of time, okay? And we see a purple line for a high heterogeneity case and a blue line for a low heterogeneous case. So the plot above shows you for, shows the results for a constant pumping rate in time, whereas uh, uh, the plot below shows for a variable pumping rate. Now, the, why do we care about this thing? Because in reality, very rarely we have constant pumping rates, okay? Uh, because of climatic factors, such as a drought here in California, or demographics, or even seasonal fluctuations, we have temporal fluctuations in the actual uh, uh, pumping rate, and this will affect the risk uh, in the catchment itself. Okay, so what we observe here is that engineering control does play a fundamental role in controlling the probability of exceedance. Okay, so here we see that for a variable pumping rate, we observe a, 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 a multimodality in the actual risk itself, whereas for a constant pumping rate, we only see a single mode. A, a, a peak, let's say, of, of the actual risk. Uh, but at the same time, we see that the magnitude is pretty much controlled by heterogeneity, okay? So even for, in both cases, we see that the purple line, the risk starts at a much earlier time because, again, when we have higher heterogeneity, 
Okay, you have fast flow channels that carry a part of the plume and that reaches the well earlier. Therefore, we have much more uh, probability at early times that the risk is going to be high, uh, of, a risk probability uh, for higher heterogeneity. So this is a very good uh, example on how anthropogenic or, or engineering factors can actually control the temporal evolution of the risk, but uh, the natural heterogeneity can also control the magnitude of the risk. So, so this shows this tension or this dramatic fight between uh, uh, natural heterogeneity that nature is actually giving us with uh, what we as humans can actually do uh, 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 by controlling the pumping operations. So let me show you uh, 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 a few examples related to chemical mixtures now. Uh, so here imagine you have a contaminant source. Uh, again, this is a, a work that I did together with Christopher Anhi and Dani Fernandez Garcia. Uh, from uh, the UPC Barcelona. Actually, Chris is right now at UC Davis. And we're actually looking at coronary solvents. So we have a PC plume which degrades into TC, DC, and eventually to VC. This is vinyl chloride. This is known to be very, very carcinogenic. Okay. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, um, this react, we want to see how heterogeneity controls the risk in this reaction chain. Okay. So we'll observe here we have the mean risk. Okay, so if you look at the mean risk, we see, see different orders of magnitude, 10 to the minus 7, all the way to 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so this is increased lifetime cancer risk because these are carcinogenics. Okay, and we see how this risk changes from the, with distance from the contaminant source. So as we move further away from the source, how is this risk actually changing? So the gray is for PC, the blue is for TC. The orange for DC and vinyl chloride VC is actually the red one over here. And the dashed line is the overall risk of the whole chemical mixture. Okay, so we did this numerically. We solved this using high resolution Monte Carlo numerical simulations. Okay, this is not analytical, so this is a little bit more complex from a point of view of, uh, of uh, geological settings and in chemical reactions. And we see that the risk is pretty much controlled by the red curve, which is vinyl chloride, because the toxicity of vinyl chloride is quite high. So uh, when we look at this, we see that it's really important to understand how the byproducts kick in. So when we think about, when we think about risk, we always think about the early arrivals of the plume. But it's not just the early arrivals in this situation, but we have to worry about the late arrivals because that reduces maybe uh, uh, the production of vinyl chloride, which is these very toxic chemicals, okay? Uh, so here, let me show uh, uh, how heterogeneity affects the risk of all of these um, of all of these chemical species. So just cope with me for uh, a minute or two on this slide because this is a really cool one uh, and I like this plot a lot. Um, we have here a series of plots, okay? In the left column, we have a low heterogeneity setting, okay? So that's, I think, sigma y squared of maybe one, if I recall correctly. And the right column is a high heterogeneity setting. So that means that our, uh, we have sigma y, uh, squared of four, the variance of log conductivity equal to four. And we have uh, dimensionless time, this is tau, and zeta is dimensionless uh, distance from the contaminant source, okay, as we start moving away from the contaminant source. The, uh, the contours actually uh, reflect the probability that each species, CI, okay, so PC, TC, DC, and VC, how they exceed, the probability of exceeding a maximum contaminant level established by uh, uh, some kind of environmental guideline, okay? So the warmer the colors, so that means the higher is this probability, all right? The lower, or let's say the lower this, this, this um, value, or in other words, the cooler colors, the lower the risks are, okay? So what we observe here, let's focus on this last, this last slide over here, okay? Let me just drink a little bit of water, okay? So, so that I can continue talking without coughing. Uh, okay, so uh, we ha let's look at this um, last slide over here, okay? So we have vinyl chloride and uh, again tau and dimensionless time and dimensionless distance. And let's look at the case of high heterogeneity. First of all, we see that there's much more yellow and blue in this plot over here, uh, plot H, when compared to plot D, okay? Because this is for vinyl chloride. So that means that when we have high heterogeneity, again, uh, we see this interplay between spreading and dilution, right? So uh, the plume is actually more spread out, there's much more dilution, therefore uh, 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 the concentrations are lower, okay? But at the same time, you have a more spread out 
a, a picture in terms of the contours because the, the plume itself is more spread out. Okay. Now, if we look at the case of low heterogeneity, we see much more uh, uh, warmer colors, much more red, because the plume, uh, uh, the vinyl chloride plume, is still um, not fully diluted or it's not so much spread out, so dilution didn't kick in so efficiently. So we still have a lot of high concentrations over here. So again, this type of map is really important for decision makers because it allows us to see how heterogeneity can affect the decision making process. Now, not only that, we can see the, the spatial persistence of these hotspots of risk, but we can also map them into corresponding time windows. So how long will this hotspot persist? So in other words, we can look at the hot moments of the actual plume itself. So again, heterogeneity reflects on the spatial temporal distribution of these probabilities of exceeding uh, a, a given MCL. So the key point here is that heterogeneity matters, and it matters a lot, and, uh, and that side characterization is important, okay? So uh, when we think about side characterization, uh, uh, this, is, this is extremely important in stochastic hydrogeology because the more data we have, okay, the closer we're getting to the, what I call the most certain case. And by most certain, I mean that we're never gonna reach a fully deterministic condition because there's always gonna be something that we don't know, either through measurement errors or external factors that we cannot control. So the more data we, we collect, this arrow is gonna to move to the left as opposed to uh, the case of the most uncertain case where we have little amount of data. And the beautiful thing about stochastic hydrogeology is that it enables us to use our physically driven models and adapt them to the data that we have. I think that's a beautiful phrase that I actually literally took from Joram Rubin's book, uh, Applied Stochastic Hydrogeology, where he actually says that stochastic hydrogeology okay, broadens the scope of the deterministic approach, right, by considering the last as an a, a, a end member of this wide spectrum of states of knowledge, pretty much like this diagram over here, right? So, so there's a continuum of states that represents various degrees of uncertainty. So the more data we collect, the more we move towards uh, the left of this diagram, okay? So predictions should be conditional on data. So let me illustrate what I mean by this. So let's condition our simulations on two different cases, okay? Let's say that our, our, our solid plume or our solid source, the container source on, is actually sitting on top of some uh, 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 low conductive zone, okay? So this is the plot that you see on the top, okay? So here we see the mean concentration plume, mean. Please notice that this is the average, not uh, the variance or any other thing. This is the mean, okay? Condition on the fact that we have uh, uh, less flow through the contaminant source, right? So the end result on average is gonna be an effectively narrow plume, but also very short, as you can see. Now, if we were to um, condition the, the mean concentration field on the opposite, where the plume is actually sitting, or the source is actually sitting on a highly conductive zone, what we see is this flow focusing effect in the source zone, and we see a longer persistence of red, in other words, longer plumes, but also a wider plume as well. Okay, again, this is on the mean, all right? This is on the average. Uh, now, the question is, how would this actually reflect in our chemical mixture. So again, this eta variable, just to um, go back over here, this eta is the actual flow rate going through the source zone divided by the expected value over the whole ensemble uh, of the flow rate crossing that uh, uh, source zone. So in other words, these are conditional simulations. If we had the capacity to condition the source zone hydraulics, how would this information, how does this information manifest, manifest itself in the act actual, um, in the actual uh, prediction, okay? So here, let's go back to the chemical mixtures and show these conditional simulations, okay? We have, again, two plots, okay? Low heterogeneity, that's on the left uh, uh, column, and high heterogeneity, that's on the right column. And we have the PDF of the increased lifetime cancer risk, the total chemical mixture uh, a PDF of the PC chemical mixture going all the way to vinyl chloride, all right? Now, the dashed line over here, uh, 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 the dashed line corresponds to uh, uh, a case where we have defocusing, so in other words, less flow to the source, these are the dashed lines, and we have a flow focusing effect, that's when eta is larger than one, that's the continuous line, and each, each row in this plot corresponds to a different uh, location, a, uh, a different distance from the source, a different control plane location, okay? So uh, the first thing that we observe is that every time we have flow focusing, uh, 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 at the source zone, at least for this situation, 
uh, we have a much lower risk in a total chemical mixture, right? And that's again because when we have full focusing, we have much more persistence of the PC plume. So, uh, in other words, the, the the vinyl chloride didn't have time to be formed yet; it's still forming itself. And vinyl chloride is the the substance that's extremely carcinogenic here, all right? Whereas when we have defocusing, uh, 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 defocusing in a source zone, in other words, this condition over here on average, okay, we observe the opposite, okay, the risk is actually higher because we have the PC plume dies quickly, but it gives time and, and increases the chance of forming the byproducts, which are more toxic than the original product itself. So this again shows how characterization really matters and that simulation should be conditional. So another point that I want to mention and again, I'm almost done with the talk, uh, is that uh, uh, characterizing the aquifer is very, very challenging, very, very costly, okay? But the point is that propagating the information from, from the field to the endpoint predictions is, uh, is something that we need to do. However, different predictions will require different information needs, all right? So, so this is the concept of goal-oriented side characterization. So in other words, if I use a different risk metric, let's say that is based on some kind of average concentrations, like, uh, um, let's say, like cancer risk, right? Or if we look at some, if we're interested in predicting arrival times to a control plane or to a well, each of these metrics, each of these predictions will require different characterization needs. And by different characterization needs, are different data types, uh, different layouts of the sampling uh, uh, where you collect the data, also the different types of uh, number of measurements that we need to reduce the uncertainty, okay? So uh, characterization should be done uh, in a goal-oriented sense. This is a uh, work that I've been, that I did in the past together with Yoram Rubin, uh, but also with Wolfgang Novak, uh, did some of that also with Sohel Zedin and also with Reed Maxwell, where we actually look how different risk metrics leads to different characterization needs. So it's really important to bring that data into our models, but uh, there's no such thing as uh, um, uh, one characterization strategy will fit all of and all of our goals in a unified manner, okay? So that's really important to keep in mind. And now for an overview, uh, I suggest you to have a look at this paper that I, I co-authored with Aldo Fiori, Alberto Medellin, Vladimir, Svechkovic and Guido Dagan on the 50th anniversary of uh, water resources research, where we actually look uh, uh, in elements and characterization all the way to risk analysis, okay? So, so it provides uh, uh, pretty much a holistic view of the problem. To wrap up, I want to show another result that a PhD, of mine, a PhD student of mine actually published recently, uh, Masa Moslehi. Uh, uh, she was actually interested in understanding how long-range correlations in the hydraulic conductivity can actually affect uh, 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 decision making. Okay, so up to now, I've been showing results uh, related to um, short range connective, uh, short range uh, correlation models, such as an exponential correlation model or uh, a Gaussian correlation model. Uh, uh, and now, what I want to see is these long correlation hydraulic conductivity fields. Okay, so in other words, I mean, uh, if we have some kind of anti persistent correlation or a persistent correlation in the actual spatial structure of the conductivity or the permeability field itself. So, this uh, uh, correlation structure is dictated by the Hertz coefficient. So, if we have a very high, uh, 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 let's say, a high H value larger than 0 0.5 we have these smooth fields over here, but with very well connected structures, okay? So that means that we have um, uh, this, this power law type of behavior kicking in uh, in the actual field itself. Whereas for low Hertz coefficients, we have this anti-persistent behavior. So in other words, I mean, we have this negative correlation between hydraulic conductivity values uh, uh, along neighboring blocks. So we have this rugged, um, let's say, map that we see right here. And the question is how, how would these maps or the Hertz coefficient affect the probability that the P concentration exceeds a critical value? And by critical value here, I'm just uh, referring to, or let's say the mass of my PhD student was just referring to uh, a fraction alpha of the initial concentration. So we were interested in looking at this. So we see that as we increase the Hertz coefficient, we start obtaining a, a larger probability and that the peak concentration will exceed a critical value. And again, this makes sense because larger Hertz coefficients, that means we have a more persistent behavior. So we have these, uh, um, um, how should I say, uh, um, 
these, uh, these fields with more connected channels, which eventually lead to a higher probability that care of, of concentration being larger than the critical value because it carries the bulk of the plume towards the control plane. So again, uh, um, you can see that these long-range correlations, can, they can also affect uh, uh, the risk. And we see something like this also in the mate site. Uh, uh, um, I'm not saying that the mate site follows this type of model, but well, we have a lot of connectivity because of the high heterogeneity, and we see that those high conductive channels, you know, they actually uh, uh, carry a big uh, portion of the plume and creating all this anormality that we actually observe in the field, okay? Uh, so, uh, concluding this talk, okay, so first of all, heterogeneity is really an important, uh, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a really important component in our risk analysis, okay? It does affect decision making. This is really, really important, okay? Uh, we need to account for this information. Um, the other thing that I want to tell you is that it's really important that you develop whatever models we use in applications or even in the way we uh, uh, developed our, 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 our science, we need to be able to communicate this effectively with decision makers, right? So it's really important to visualize how these risks persist in time but also in space. And that means that having tools that allow us to visualize these hot spots, you know, but also these hot moments is really critical. So that's why I like plots like these ones, like the one you saw with the chemical mixtures, or even your Kubovice matrix that allows us to identify where we can expect more mixing or more reactions, or, or, or we can expect to observe higher concentration values, okay? And this somehow is also dictated by, uh, again, the geological formation and also the connective structure itself, okay? So it's really better to communicate this with people. The other thing that I want to highlight in this presentation is this dramatic fight between spreading and mixing, okay? But notice that this dynamics of spreading and mixing can be uh, detrimental or beneficial to risk depending how you see it. So for a case of a non-reactive transport, it is something that's beneficial because it dilutes the plume very quick. But from a reactive transport point of view, especially in a chain where the byproducts, the byproducts of the reaction itself is more toxic than the mother product or, or, or the original product that's, that's, that you release into the aquifer, this, uh, uh, this uh, let's say, this credit mixing can be quite uh, 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 detrimental to risk until the plume is completely diluted, okay, in the sense of uh, natural attenuation, okay. The other thing that I want to highlight is something that people oftentimes neglect the role of engineering design, okay, but also engineering factors, things that we can actually control, you know, because sometimes these engineering components, they can actually overshadow the effects of heterogeneating. Sometimes, not saying always, but we have to be very, very careful over here. Okay, I showed to you that uh, the sampling dimensions, the, 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 the dimensions of the sampling device, such as the uh, observation well, can pretty much control the tails of the concentration CDF. We've seen that, I showed that to you. But at the same time, if we have changes uh, 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 in our, 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 our pumping rate, I mean, the way we're actually extracting water, that can actually also control the risk itself. So it's really important to incorporate these things into our analysis. Finally, uh, uh, summarizing, if I had to uh, boil down this talk into a single phrase, I, I have to say the risk should be viewed as a multi-component stochastic system. In other words, a system of systems, okay? I mean, we need to look at this from a characterization point of view, identify the value of information in our predictions uh, before actually collecting the data because data costs a lot of money, and then uh, 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 be able to model this uncertainty and communicate this uncertainty and, 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 and this information with people that are actually doing the site management or, or controlling, let's say, uh, or making decisions related to the actual uh, uh, risk itself, okay? Because people will be exposed to that. So it's really important to understand how these factors, you know, including engineering design, affects the shape of the actual PDF itself. Uh, I think I should be running out of time soon, so with this I will conclude. And once again, I would like to say thank you to Diolo uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity and also to Liz for the technical component as well. And uh, thanks to every, uh, each one of you, for everyone, thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, guys, if you have any questions, please type it into the chat box and then we will read it out loud for Felipe to answer. And while we're waiting for questions, I will take this back. Sure. 
and show. So I have no idea where I should see the questions over here, Liz. My apologies, I don't. Oh, no worries. We haven't got any questions yet. Um, yep. So everyone can type their questions in the chat box if you have any. And while we're waiting for questions, just want to point out that we have one more talk in the Cyber Seminar series for next week. It will be from Pietro Diana. Um, he will be talking about biological and chemical activities and confined flows, the role of heterogeneity and segregation. Um, again, the talk will be at 3 o'clock, and you must register beforehand to attend. And then other thing to note as well is that um, Quasi will have a conference on hydroinformatics this summer um, in July at Tuscaloosa, and we're currently seeking abstracts for oral and po poster presentations, and the deadline is April 15th. So. Come on, guys. You have to have questions out there. <laughs> maybe I talk too fast. Or maybe you just explain, thing, explain things very well so you don't have any questions. Somehow I got this. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. You're boosting my morale over here. <laughs> Sorry for the joke. Questions? Give it a few more minutes. That's okay. That's okay. Actually, the more I stay here, the better. This way, I don't have to eat. <laughs> We're on Pacific time. But it's good for my diet. Felipe, as the host, let me maybe ask a question then. That's okay. Thank you, Dio. Okay. No, of course. No, I mean, so given, you know, given some of the talks that we had last week, so the talk we had last week and Arena's one as well, which focused on anomalous transport, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're you're looking very much at variability and, and, and the likes in heterogeneous systems. How do you incorporate the kind of anomalous transport models that Rina and and uh, Antoine were talking about into these kind of risk-based frameworks that you're talking about? Well, uh, again, I have to remind my I, I, I briefly saw the talks, okay, uh, so I don't have a, a, um, so, a so, edge, but I remember that I think that the Antoine and, and, and Rina, they talked about uh, like CTRW type of models, right? Correct, correct. Exactly, so I think that could actually be incorporated uh, in, a, in a very straightforward way, I mean, uh, it's just substituting the flow module, right? The flow module with a different, uh, the transfer module with a different flow module, right? Um, it's just the way you approach the problem, which will be different from from a point of view of parameterizing the model itself. But you don't think, okay? My, I guess my question is, brother. So, so you don't think one one of the things about the CTRW models and fractional dispersion models is, in some sense, they're kind of, you know, they they capture a mean behavior, no variability around that, right? It, Indeed, 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 indeed. So and what I think, what I think the way, okay. So I think this goes back to even our paper, Diogo, the one that we wrote together on on, on concentration rebounds. Remember that one? Yes. Uh, I think that we can try to think of this problem from a different angle, and maybe not from a. Um, we can incorporate maybe a parametric uncertainty by running the CTRW uh, or, or any type of model uh, multiple times for different sets of parameters. So you see what I mean? Yep. By incorporating parametric uncertainty, maybe I know that the uh, a given parameter is within a given range, right? Or, or maybe there is some kind of estimation error that we can take into account, and maybe we can run the different models and get different responses, like in a multi column basis, uh, and maybe collect the statistics of that that, that field again of, of that uh, of that model itself. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Okay, Thank you. that's one way of doing it. Of course, these different models they have different ways of being parameterized. Of course. Uh, and of course, I mean, the framework would be, uh, I think, slightly different, but if we think of an uncertainty point of view, uh, I think it's just pretty much boils down to a Monte Carlo uh, uh, approach. Thanks, Philippe. We'll, yeah, yeah, we want to be generating the field itself, we'll just be changing the parameter values, I think. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other questions out there? Yep, we have another one. Let me just... Oh, hi, good day. <laughs> All right. So this one's for Mark Howell. Um, his question is, do you have recommendations for quantifying aquifer heterogeneity? Also difficult to collect undisturbed samples for lab analysis, and many field methods give bulk results. Yeah, this is a, okay. That's a very interesting question for many aspects because, I mean, 
we always disturb the field, right? But there are some really interesting new techniques out there. Uh, uh, if you look at the, some developments at the MAID site, um, uh, I don't know if you had a chance, Mark, to actually look into that, but there's so many other techniques, you know, uh, that are very non-intrusive, uh, like direct push uh, techniques. I mean, or they do, I mean, they, they, they have some, of course, they're always pros and cons, uh, but they can get some different types of information. So, uh, yeah, there's some methods out there, uh, and we have new technologies nowadays that make them much better. Another very interesting and promising technique, in my view, is uh, uh, image training. So you take images of outcrops, and you try to develop or, or construct an image of the aquifer based on, 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 on outcrops. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, but these are the type of recommendations that I will have. By looking at the literature, you see that there are plenty of new techniques out there which are trying to be non-intrusive because that actually affects tremendously our predictions, indeed. All right, do we have any more questions? All right, looks like we have, don't have any more questions, but if that's a question does arise, uh, feel free to email me directly, and I will um, pass it on to Felipe. All right, All right well, thank I, you. Yeah, I think that's it. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending the Cyber Seminar, and we hope you all have a great uh, afternoon and weekend. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye, Diogo. Bye-bye, Liz. Bye-bye, guys. Okay, Thank bye. you very much, Philippe. Much appreciated. Please join us next week for Pietro's uh, seminar. It's the last in the series, and I hope everyone will enjoy it. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Right, bye.